Are you ready? Here we go. Without any notes or help. All right. All right here we go. I commit myself to love, to learn, to lead, and to live, and to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. Father, as we start our teaching time of this worship service, may you be our teacher. May we have a heart that's ready to hear, and not just hear, but to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. Well, for the last uh, few weeks, I don't know if I'm a little loud. For the last few weeks, we have been talking about um, a little series that we've called Kidnapped, and today we're going to transition from the Kidnapped series to another title, which I'll give you in a minute. But the Kidnap series, um, if you remember, has kind of followed the Colossians 3 passage. And in that passage, we, we learned that, and we're going to read it in a second here, but we've learned that basically, as a believer in Jesus, we need to kind of see ourselves as, as a group of people who need to kind of put off some things so that we can put on some things. In other words, we have, to, we have a pattern of thinking that has been self-destructive. And now that we've become alive to the truth or awake to the truth, it's, it's almost as if we were all kidnapped as children, raised in a destructive home by an evil kidnapper, and now Jesus has come and rescued us, and now it's a whole new way of thinking. Like everything we were learned, you know, everything we were taught growing up was wrong, and so we have to be retrained in this whole new way of thinking. And that new way of thinking is the kingdom thinking, right? Jesus is the king of the, of the universe. He has won the victory. He is King Jesus. And we, his disciples, his followers, are going to live on earth with him as our king, right? So that God's will will be done on earth as it's already being done where? In heaven, In heaven right? That's the whole idea. So here's the, here was the teaching, right? If then, this is what Paul's saying, if then you have been raised with Christ, so if you're going to identify in that baptismal water being raised with Christ, then you need, me need, we, we need to seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. He's in power, seated there as the ruler. And so what do we do? We set our minds on things above. So it's this idea. Here's what the idea is. Even though no one in the world recognizes the true Lord of the universe, the true king of the earth, they recognize all these other pretenders to the throne, right? Which is usually ourselves, isn't it true? Right? We as Christians, we as believers, as followers of Jesus, we recognize his authority. And we live that way. And that changes everything, doesn't it? And so as Paul said in this next series, and this is what we've been talking about, as, as kidnapped victims, we were trained to think in a whole lot of ways that were self-destructive. And so this passage that we read is all about putting to death. And so the Greek word about putting on and putting off is kind of like a garment. So we put off or we put to death that which is earthly in us. And we looked at these sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness. And then another list, which was also hard to hear, uh, anger and wrath and malice and uh, slander and obscene talk. And so these are the things that need to be put to death. And as you know, if you've been here the last few weeks, the sermons have been kind of tough, haven't they? I mean, they haven't even been fun for me. <laughs> you know, the things we have to put to death and the ways that we aren't really there as a, as a people of God yet, we're growing in that. And, you know, sometimes it can get kind of discouraging. And, and, but, you know, you know, guys, I think it's better to hear the truth and see where we fall short than just to hear a bunch of lies that make us feel comfortable and, and realize that we're not really where God wants us. And so it's better to be honest with the truth and grasp the truth and grapple with the truth than just to like, oh, everything's fine. You're okay. I'm okay. We're all okay. You know, that's not okay. You get what I'm saying? Not, not if you're a Christian. And so as a Christian, we're to put off those things. But now is the good list, okay? Now here's the, here's the positive side. So I'm going to put my Joel Olstein smile on and give you a positive message today. <laughs> all right? And so what are we going to do? Well, First off, he says, you know, don't lie to each other. Seeing that you've put off the old self with practices, but put on this new self. So here's a new, a new thing to put on. And the first thing we're going to do, and I love this. This is awesome. So imagine I'm putting this on. I won't do it because I'll be too hot if I do that. But imagine I put this on. This new self that I'm putting on 
is renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So this new self is being renewed. As I grow and understand God, he's starting to renew me. And I love how he says this. Here, there is not Greek and Jew. Now let me explain that. Here, there is not Greek. Wait, where's here? Where's he talking about? Here, in this covenant community of kingdom people, right? The people God has called out of the world to become his followers. In this community of Christians, in this community of D- Jesus followers, there's no more distinctions like there are outside of here. Do you get, get me? Here, there's no Greek and Jew. You know, that's an old one, right? We, we all know this. If you've read your Old Testament, there's this Jew-Gentile distinction, right? And there was this splitting between the Jews and the Gentiles, and that was a common source of prejudice and bigotry and, and uh, a lack of love for one another. In fact, Jesus went and corrected, and he showed how many times the Jews, they, they missed the whole point with this separation. It wasn't so they could be God's chosen and frozen. <laughs> that wasn't the point for God to choose this people. It was God's point to choose this people was so they would go and share the love with the rest of the world. But what they did is they us four shut the door no more kind of attitude with, with the Jewish people. And so that wasn't the point of what God was trying to do with the Jews, Jewish nation. It was so they would love the rest of the world. And so Paul is saying here in this new covenant co- community that God is calling out of the world, there isn't this distinction between Jews and Greeks. But not only did the Jews have this distinction, the Greeks had this distinction, right? If you were a Greek, then you weren't a barbarian, right? They looked at everyone who was non-Greek as barbarian. So even in the Greek world, they had their have and have-nots. So in the Jewish world, you had the Jews and the Gentiles, or the circumcised and the uncircumcised, the unclean. And you had, in the Greek world, you had the learned and educated Greek and all the rest of them. They're all barbarians, you know? What an arrogant position to have, right? And so Paul is correcting all of these arrogant prejudices, He says, that shouldn't be in this covenant community. Now, I want to look at one more point here. And he talked about barbarian and then Scythian. Now, what in the world is a Scythian? If you think about this list, it is kind of odd, right? Greek and Jew, those are big groups. We understand that. Or circumcised and uncircumcised, you guys understand that. We just talked about barbarians. I told you if you weren't a Gentile, or sorry, if you weren't a Greek, you were a barbarian. But then he has, and then he has a Scythian word. What is that? We'll look at that in a second. And then slave and free. And we all know what that is, especially in this first century. I mean, there was some estimates 75% of the Roman government or the Roman population were slaves. So three out of four people were slaves. That's a huge number. That no wonder they were worried about slave riots in the, in, in the Roman world, right? And so Paul says even the slave-free distinction doesn't exist in Christianity, when you come in through those doors and you meet with the body of believers, you're not a slave. You're not, that's not your identity. Your identity is you're a member of Christ's covenant community. You're just as equal as that freedman. What a beautiful mosaic of people God is calling into, into his co- covenant. But what about the Scythian one, right? That is a, that is a little out, out of place if you think about it. Well, I had to do a little research. What was that? What was a Scythian anyway? And a Scythian was a people group, an isolated tribe, a people group off of the Black Sea. So if you know where the Black Sea over in the Middle East, this people group lived there, and they were kind of the butt of all of the jokes for the rest of the civilized world. If you were, a, if you were called a Scythian, even if you really weren't one, that was like a derogatory name because it was a, basically a, a way of saying someone who was, as one scholar says, uncouth in his speech and in his actions. So kind of an awkward person, like, it would just be, you know, in that day, a really bad name to call someone, right? So, in fact, they were, they were actually saying that there were these Greek dramas and, and comedies, and, you know, the Greeks loved their comedies, and you could even still read some of their comedies today, and they'd have these amphitheaters where they'd watch dramas and comedies being performed, like, down and below, and they would always have a Scythian in the comedy just to be the butt of all the jokes in the, in the play, Now, how sad is that, right? They're just making fun of this people group. And Paul actually identifies this people group, the butt of the jokes of the the first century, as also welcomed at the table of Christ. Isn't that awesome? 
This is, this, and this is, becomes key for what we're about to teach. So what we're learning here, to, before we learn the things to put on, is in Jesus, there's no more prejudice. Today, white and black, no more. We are colorblind as Christians, right? There's no more prejudice in, in Christ. We are all equals. Gender gaps are not there in Christianity. There's no male, female, as Galatians teaches us. We're one in Christ. And so this is important for this next list. And so this gets into what we're going to study today. So all that was just free, okay? That was just free. This is the real stuff today. So here's what we're putting on today. So now that we got it straight, that there's no more racial or social divisions or economic divisions in Christ, we're all, we're all together. Now we're going to be taught what to put on. So what are we going to put on? He says, put on then, and that's honestly the Greek, the Greek image is actually like a garment to put on. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Now, I love this, this language. It's the same language the Jews had for themselves as we're God's chosen ones. Paul's actually using that same language to talk about Christians. You now are God's chosen ones. And all of the, all of the role that the nation of Israel had is now on to you to fulfill. You are God's new covenant community. You are God's chosen ones. Now you put on these, these virtues, and here's what they are. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. So as Christians, we are to put on, as disciples of Jesus, we are to put on these virtues. And now that we've taken off those vices, that sexual immorality and all that, we've taken that off, and that anger and wrath, we've taken that off. We now have room to put on these, these virtues, right? And so I, I knew that we were going to be talking about what to put on, right? And I was thinking about this, like, okay, we need to put on these virtues. And I started reading through them here in Colossians uh, 3.12. And when I saw the list, I said, you know what? I can talk, we're going to talk about compassion today and kindness today. You know, we'll talk about humility in a couple weeks or whenever, me and Eddie need to talk about that. <laughs> but we're going to go through some of these virtues. But, you know, I said, you know, what are the jobs of a pastor, a Bible teacher is? It's not just to, not just to read through a text, but to make sure that the, that the people understand the full power of the text. And one of the jobs as any Bible student is supposed to do is to understand how did this sound when the first readers read those words. In other words, this is a letter to Colossians, to the church at Colossae. So here's the question. When those Christians, 20 centuries ago, when they read this, how did that sound to them? And, and, and the reason that's important is because if I don't really read it like they read it, because you guys all understand, it's kind of like reading somebody else's mail. Does that make sense? This was a letter written to somebody else. Now, it's inspired for us and our benefit, but we have to kind of get into their world to understand that. And when I thought for a second of how it must have sounded to a first century Greco-Roman, now Christian, <laughs> living in modern Turkey, that's where Colossae was, I thought, whoa, this had to blow them away. For Paul to write that they are to be compassionate and, and kind and humble, these commands had to have just really blown them away. And I'll tell you why. You know, today we don't realize how impacted our culture has been by the gospel of Jesus. I've called my little series here our cruciform culture, how Jesus changed everything. And here's what I mean. I believe that our culture in the West has been so shaped by the cross of Jesus that we don't even understand how profoundly our thinking has been changed because of Jesus. I'll give you an example. If there was on the news today a terrible story of an earthquake or hurricane, a tsunami, some terrible tragedy in some foreign distant land, within hours of that news, what would be on the radio and what would be on the TV? Appeals for what? For, them, for us to help. We would get a news report about the United States government dropping food aid, right? Now, these are people we're not related to. They don't speak our language. They don't even share our culture or our values, 
and immediately everyone in the United States and in Europe, those countries shaped by this culture I'm talking about, will, Christian or not, doesn't matter, a lot of Europe is now no longer Christian. They're post-Christian. We're headed that way. They would pull, we would all pull our wallets. Oh, yeah, the right thing to do is to hand out money. That's crazy. That is crazy. Why is that crazy, Brad? That's as obvious as a sunrise, isn't it? No, it isn't obvious at all. The idea that we should help someone else is directly related to a carpenter from Nazareth who changed the world. And we're going to learn that today. You ready? Okay. So I figured to myself, how could I illustrate this? How could I illustrate how weird these words would have sounded? How can I illustrate that? And so I, I said, what I was going to do is I was going to tell you a history story, true story. And I was going to show you what that culture was really like in the first century or second century. So where we're going to be, we're going to go back in time, okay? So go with me, back in time, imagine. And we're in the year 165 AD. We're all there. And where we are is we're on the outskirts of, of the capital of the Roman Empire, Rome itself. We're in Italy. We're watching, and to our horror comes a stream, a caravan, as it was recorded by an eyewitness. This is a true story. A caravan of carts and wagons. And on those carts and on those wagons are piled high dead bodies. And we are just, what in the world is happening? What we are witnessing is the first known outbreak of the smallpox virus. And Rome is in the throes of a terrible plague. They call it the Plague of Galen. Up to 2,000 people a day are dying in the streets of Rome, and no one has any idea why. It, imagine what it would have been like to live in a, in a world of pre, pre-medicine, where you don't know why people just all of a sudden get some kind of outbreak and then nine days later die. I mean, how scary would that be? Well, Rome is terrified. In fact, they actually call for the most famous physician alive, his name was Galen, to come from his home in Turkey to come and see what was going on. And Galen arrives in Rome and, you know, he, the, 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 uh, the historical documents say that this guy's normally like a prolific writer. He's one of our biggest sources from the ancient world for medicine. He, he catalogs so many things and doesn't matter. He's normally very prolific of a writer. When he got to Rome, he barely describes the symptoms. Do you know why? Because when he got there, he turned around and left because <laughs> it was hopeless. That's what's going on in Rome. Well, what if you're a citizen in Rome in 165 AD? Well, in 165 AD, Christianity is a very small minority. So the majority religion of Rome is paganism. You have a temple on every corner. So you're going to your local priest of your local temple, and you're looking for some spiritual guidance. But guess what? The temple priest is gone. Why is he gone? Because he hit the road when this plague hit. He had more money than the average guy and he's hitting the road for the high country because he knows, I'm out of here. It's a save your own skin kind of mentality. Along with the priests, the rich aristocrats have left the, have left the city. And so who are, who are in the streets writhing in this pestilence and in this plague? The common person. But they aren't the only ones there. In fact, although Galen didn't say much about what was happening, he did notice something. He noticed that in, and this is an artist's rendition, this is the archaeological dig that he found of these bodies from that, from that plague outside of Rome. And here's just an artist's picture of what it looked like. And Galen, he noticed this. There were a group of people, a very small minority, in the city of Rome who nurtured and, and cared for the sick and the dying. Everyone else is is leaving like rats off a sinking ship, but this group of Christians, he called them, showed their contempt of death every day. Now, what does that mean? Here's what it means. These guys didn't care that they might die. They didn't care. In fact, they had almost like a, a contempt for death. Like, who cares? Death, big deal. There's people dying here. Unfortunately, this isn't the only mass plague that the ancient world had to face about 90 years later, an even more severe plague hit the Roman Empire. In fact, scholars are now saying that they may have not factored in how much the plagues had to do with the decline of Rome. Uh, in fact, in this particular plague, they had to stop an entire war because there were so many people dying from the plague. They had to stop, they had to call their military back 
because there were so many people dying in, in, in this plague. In the second plague that happens about 90 years later, Christianity has grown a little bit since then, and we have more written down about what's going on. And so I want to read to you a little bit about what the leaders of the church are saying. This first guy, this guy is Cyprian, and he's the leader of the church at Carthage. This next plague doesn't just center on Rome. This next plague plague is more empire wide so we have we have people suffering of this plague in all of the roman empire and most scholars think that this next plague was the first outbreak of measles we're not sure but notice what cyprian says just a record this is in the year 250 a.d he says many of us are dying from this plague and pestilence he's just recording what's going on many of us are dying here so this is the church leader and he's saying just there's death everywhere now you think about it. If you're a pagan and you don't know anything about Jesus, you don't know anything about Christianity, here's what you're thinking. The gods are angry and we don't know why. Right? There's no relationship with gods. Everything is kind of faded. It's a very, very, very pessimistic worldview. There's not a lot of hope here. In other words, you're born into your station in life. You kind of live in your station. You don't kind of grow. You don't kind of get, you know, get better and improve yourself. You're just kind of faded where you are in that worldview. But here are these Christians. And here's what another one says. This is, another, this is a bishop of Alexandria, which was in Egypt, also part of the Roman Empire. This is about 10 years later. And look what he says. Dionysus of Alexandria, he says, this is his firsthand observation. The heathen, at the first outset of the disease, they, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest so here's what he's saying. He goes, whenever a new person comes down with this disease, it could be their kids, it could be their parents, it doesn't even matter. They, as soon as this happens, they just shove them out into the street. Look what it says. Throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. So that was their response. Their response is, oh my gosh, mom, you have the disease, get out! And they chuck their parents out into the street. The kind of save yourself kind of mentality. Well, how did our brothers and sisters, well, before I talk about that, let me tell you what Rodney Stark, a distinguished scholar from Baylor University, he kind of explains why the, why the response was this way from the non-believers, from the pagans of the day. Why did they respond that way? Why didn't they try to help each other? I mean, why, why, did, why did they just basically, oh, yeah, get away, you know, kick him out? Why did they do that? Well, here's what he says. He says, in the pagan world, especially among the philosophers, mercy was regarded as a character defect and pity as a pathological emotion because mercy involves providing unearned help or relief it was, they thought, contrary to justice. Remember when I talked to you about how they, the, everyone thought in, the, in that, that day that the gods kind of determined everything and you were kind of fated? And so here's what they thought. If you try to help someone else, you would be kind of going against the will of the gods because God, the gods have obviously determined for whatever reasons this happened to that person. You know, guys, um, a lot of atheists today rail against Christianity. And they claim that we're not compassionate and that there are hypocrites among us. You know, guys, they're right. There are some of us that are not compassionate and there are hypocrites among us. I don't even want to deny the charge. But here's what I want to point out. That if Jesus had never come, there would never be a culture that understands compassion is good and a lack of compassion is bad. And that hypocrisy is bad and a lack of hypocrisy is good. In that culture that we're talking about, it was as common as ever to just say, you must have some kind of black mark on you and I'm not going to help you. In fact, today there are cultures, even in 2012, where the gospel has not penetrated very deeply and that is still the common view. I've been to India. I don't know if anyone else has been to India and I don't know if you know a lot about their culture. But India is ruled by a... By a a Hinduistic view of, of the world that is very much steeped in, in a view of karma and reincarnation. And one of the big problems in India with helping humanitarian relief efforts is that people in India believe that if you relieve the suffering of someone, you are interfering with their karmic debt. 
And that if you stop whatever the gods or whatever has been fated for that person, they're just simply going to have to repeat that in their next life. So the very most compassionate thing you could do is let the poor person suffer it out. How tragic is that? How dehumanizing is that? In fact, let me read to you what some of the philosophers of the Greek world said. Here's a philosopher, Plateus, and he said a couple hundred years before Christ, you do a beggar a bad service by giving him food or drink. Here's why. You lose what you give, so you're giving money and you're losing it, and you prolong his life for more misery. I mean, what a pest. I can't help you because if I helped you, I it would be wasting my money and I would just be keeping you alive longer. So you would just have more suffering. Like the best thing to do is just to die. In fact, Aristotle, for all of his wisdom and for all of his you know, appeals to how, how great a man he was, Aristotle actually believed that some human beings were born to be slaves. He called them living tools. That was his view. Some are just born to be slaves. The gods have faded it, and they're just living tools. Another scholar, E.A. Judge, e. Judge, explained, classical philosophers, that would be philosophers from this period, taught that mercy indeed is not governed by reason at all. Humans must learn to curb the impulse. The cry of the undeserving for mercy must go unanswered. Pity, they said, was a defect of character unworthy of, of the wise and inex- inexcusable. And, I'm sorry, and excusable only in those who have not yet grown up. The point is, if you just could grow up, you would realize that you should not be merciful to anyone else. Now, I want, you to point, I want to point out something. So you have this culture that says mercy and compassion and pity are the most unwise and the most, uh, it's actually a defect of character to care for someone else. And then you have this whole movement of Christians doing the total opposite. In fact, I want to read to you the Easter sermon from the year 230. So this is, I'm sorry, 260. This is right at the end of that terrible plague. And the pastor Dionysius, or Dionysius, he's addressing his congregation. And this is on Easter Sunday, the Sunday of the resurrection. And here's what he says. Most of our brothers Our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking of only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their very need and ministering to them in Christ. They were infected by by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Many in nursing and curing others, transferred their death to themselves and died in their stead or in their place. The best of our brothers lost their lives in this manner. You can almost even now, you know, whatever, 18 centuries later, you can, you can almost hear the pride in that pastor's voice. Like he's saying to his church, good job. You guys, we love them. We gave our lives for them that were dying in this plague. Where are the pagans? They're gone. Where are the priests? Where are the spiritual leaders? In fact, Rodney Stark, the guy I mentioned earlier, he actually argues that one of the reasons Christianity grew so fast was because of these plagues, that in those plagues, two things happened. Only the Christians were there to to, to nourish people and to care for people. And so guess who survived more? Those underneath the Christian's care. In fact, they estimated that it gave you about a 20% chance, a higher chance of survival. So you have more survivors because of the Christian's care. And when the plague was over, guess who, are now, guess who now have the spiritual credibility in the eyes of the people? You're right, it's those Christians. And so Rodney Stark says, we may have never realized how much the plagues and the pestilences of the first couple centuries of the, after the church was born aided the spread of the gospel. Jesus won. Jesus conquered Rome. Isn't that awesome? You know, in this little free note, I didn't talk about this last service, so you guys get the free stuff this service. Think about this. In the garden, I'm sorry, in the, in the scene in Jerusalem, remember the crowd? They say, crucify him, crucify him. Remember those haunting words? We have no king but who? Caesar, right? Jesus conquers Caesar. If you go to Rome today, you don't see a pagan temple on every corner. You see a cross on every corner. 
And you know the battle cry of the early church was not Caesar is Lord. You know what it was? Jesus is Lord. You know why they went to the, their deaths in the catacomb or in the gladiator arenas? Because they refused to say Caesar is Lord. Here's what they were doing, guys. Here's what they were doing. I know you guys all think Caesar is Lord. He ain't Lord. Jesus is Lord. Kill me. It doesn't matter. He's Lord. They had no regard for death. That's these brothers and sisters that we are privileged enough to be in the same family with. Those are our older brothers. Those are our older sisters. That was free. Let's get back to the sermon. Okay, so where did they learn all this stuff, right? How did they learn this? How did they learn to do this? Well, here's Paul's words. So now, I know we've been on a little trail here, but now come back. We're back in the first century. We're back in Colossae. We're the first church to ever hear this. And Paul says, compassionate hearts. You're scratching your head and say, I've never, I've never seen compassion before. This is a whole new virtue. Again, in the 21st century, we all understand compassion because of Jesus. But we've got to remember what it would have been like back then. They'd never seen it before. Except one place. Where had they seen it before? Where had Paul seen it before? Where did Paul get this from? You've guessed it. Jesus. Jesus, the radical teacher from Nazareth. And look what he says. Jesus is on a boat. He has just heard that his, his cousin John the Baptist has been beheaded by the, by, by the Herodians. And now he knows that he is headed towards the cross. This is a turning point in Jesus' ministry. It's probably a very low point emotionally for him. He's a human man. We can't discount this. Jesus felt these emotions. And so he probably just wants to withdraw, kind of be alone in the mountain, maybe just pray. And he sees pressing needs all around him. Again, the culture says, hey, I don't owe anybody anything. There's no, 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 no ethic of compassion. What does Jesus do? He goes out from himself, it says, and he has great compassion on this crowd, and he heals them. I love this. This is a uh, wonderful scene, too. Jesus has been invited to a banquet. And at this banquet, a rich, a rich uh, Pharisee has invited Jesus over for dinner. Now, in this first century, even in the Jewish culture, the same idea that the Greeks and the Romans had was in the Jewish culture, and this idea was this. It's all about my honor. It's all about my prestige and my reputation. So they have what's called an honor-shame culture. So here's the point. If I'm inviting you over for dinner, I'm only inviting you for one reason, for my honor. And I invite only special people to my house because it wouldn't do any good to invite people who aren't very popular or very important. I'm inviting important people, rich people. Why? So you can say nice things about me, your host. And what does that do? That increases my status in the, in the community. That makes me have more honor. It's an honor-shame deal. In fact, the very, this is another free thing. I'm giving you a lot of free stuff today. Do you remember when in the prodigal son story, the older son refuses to go in to the father's banquet? Do you know what that was like in that culture? To refuse an invitation to a banquet was a complete slap. And do you remember the story where Jesus teaches about a king who has a son who's having a marriage and the invited guests don't show up? In that culture, remember they say, he sends his servants out, well, just find anyone, you know, because I want my banquet hall full. This was an extreme insult. And so Jesus is at this guy's house for dinner. I just would love to see this. He's eating dinner, and the p proper thing to do, if, you, if you're invited, as an invited guest, is to praise the host. That's the whole point of you being there. You're supposed to say what a great guy he is. You're supposed to raise his reputation. And Jesus looks at the guy. This is awesome. He looks at the guy and he says, hey, when you guys throw a feast, don't invite all the rich people. Don't invite all your friends. You know how you should invite? This is at the feast, though. This is like at the table. This is, they're around the little triclinium. They're just chilling. You, you know, this whole thing's all show. <laughs> this is awesome, right? He says, here's what you do. You invite, you invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you because that's what you're looking for. You'll get repaid at the resurrection. How crazy was that in that culture? Do you guys understand that? See, today, we're so shaped by the cross, our culture, even if we're not a Christian culture anymore, we're so shaped by the cross, we all understand, hey, it's a nice thing to help poor people out. They wouldn't have understood that back then. I'm getting kind of excited. All right, let's go on. What about this story? This is probably the greatest illustration of all of the illustrations. This is the Good Samaritan story. 
a teacher of the law comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how do I go into the eternal kingdom? How do I go into the eternal God kingdom? And Jesus says, well, you're a teacher of the law. What does the law say? Well, the law says to love God and to love others, essentially. And Jesus goes, well, you got the right answer. Do that and you'll be fine. And the guy goes, wait a second. He goes, define others. Actually, in the text, it's neighbor. What is a really, what is a na- who do I really have to be nice to? Who do I really have to love? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you a story. And Jesus tells this amazing story of selfless compassion for someone who could not pay you back and who would be on the wrong side of the fence. And you know the story. I, I, for time's sake, because I did all those rabbit trails, I gotta kind of skip this. But you guys all know the story. Right? Look at this last part of it. Shows that he had compassion. Look what this guy says. This is what the Samaritan says to the innkeeper. And I'm assuming you all know this story. At the very end, take care of him. And whatever you spend, whatever more you spend, I will repay. He is taking the care of the sick, taking care of the wounded, right? Doesn't that sound a lot like what those second century, third century Christians were doing? They were living out the Good Samaritan story. They had been taught by Jesus the Good Samaritan story. Paul had put it in in the letter that he wrote to Colossians, and now the Christians, two centuries later, are living out the Good Samaritan story. What a great, amazing, obedient body of Jesus doing that to this world. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. And so, I want to, then he looks at that guy and says, hey, you do the same thing. Like, oh my gosh, we, we, we were never told to do that. This is all new stuff. Where did Jesus learn this from? Where did Jesus get this from? From his father. This is the book of Exodus, and this is, I'm not gonna go here too long. I'm assuming you guys know this too, but our God is a compassionate God. And even though the Jews had the Old Testament, a lot of times they created these other laws to kind of get out of the commands that they were told directly by God to do. They kind of figured out ways to maneuver around and not really be loving like they were told to be. Good warning for all of us. We could do the same thing. But this story in Exodus is saying, hey, if you're a rich guy and you're going to loan some money to someone and you want some collateral to make sure they pay you back and the only thing they have is literally the shirt off their back, better not take their shirt because when they lay down at night and they don't even have a bed, all they have is that little cloak. They need that to keep warm. And if you take that from them, the only possession they have, and they cry out to me, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to hear it because I'm a compassionate God and I'm not going to tolerate you taking advantage of poor people. That was in their law. All Jesus was doing is, that's the kind of God of the Old Testament and I'm telling you, this is the kind of mandate my followers are going to have. You're going to be compassionate people. You're going to be known for your compassion. And then the final thing Jesus taught, which is probably just the most powerful scene ever, Jesus is now giving, he's he's about to die. This is in Matthew 25. There's only 28 chapters in Matthew, so you know it's near the end, right? And so Jesus is given a picture of what the end looks like, the judgment. And he says, what God is gonna do with the judgment is he's gonna gather all the nations, not just the Jews, the whole earth before him. And he's gonna separate, like a shepherd would separate goats from sheep, or, you know, he's going to do a separation deal. And the goats are going to go to his left, and the sheep are going to go to his right. And he's going to say to those sheep, he's going to say, you guys, you gave me food when I was hungry. You gave me water when I was thirsty. You put clothes on my back when I was, when I was naked. You, you took care of me when I was sick and injured. And when I was in prison, you fed me. And you know what the sheep are going to say back? Right here. Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we ever see that? We don't ever recall seeing that. You know what I love about this response? It shows their honest surprise. Here's what I mean. The true sheep are not just doing the sheep things so that God will see them so that maybe they can make the big man upstairs happy and somehow win his approval so they can go to heaven. No, no, no. Real sheep are people who really are compassionate. And when no one even looks and they don't even know if anyone notices, 
They're just being compassionate. So there's a, there's a naked guy. They go get clothes. There's a sick guy. They go, they go help the sick guy. There's a hungry guy. They just go help the hungry guy. They're not doing this to try, somehow win points in heaven. They're just doing this because they've been transformed by the gospel and they're just living that out. The very fact, here's the point, that they did not know that they were being seen shows the authenticity of that virtue. Does that make sense? And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of them, you did it to me. Like, really? You know what I believe? In the second century, in the plague of Galen, or in the third century, in the plague of Cyprus, or Cyprus, and those Christians are grabbing those guys off the street that they don't even know, that aren't even their, they're not even fellow Christians, they're pagans or whatever, they're just, and they're grabbing them and they're nursing them. They're saying, this is for Jesus, this is Jesus. And I'm going to love them just like it's Jesus. That's just who they were. So now I come to the end of my sermon. I'm going to ask you a question. And this will be more what we talk about next week too, but just to kind of give you something to think about as we go home. All right, Brad, it's 2012. It's not 250 or 260 or 165. It's 2012. How do I put on compassion today? How do I become like what you're saying? How do I put this on? How do I put this compassion on? And I'm going to give you just a few suggestions here. And then I'm going to give you something really, I hope that you just think about all week. In fact, I hope the question I give you will bother you so much that you just can't wait to discuss it. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Number one, I think the first step to putting on any virtue is to realize that it's not optional. I do this all the time with my kids. If I say, hey, kids, you know, there's a test. The last question, you don't have to answer it. If that last question is hard, guess what they don't do? They don't answer it. But what if I put that question on the test as one of the non-optional ones? What do they all try? They all try to answer it. You know why? Because it went from being optional to being compulsory. Does that make sense? When we realize we have no choice, I have to do this, guess what we're all going to do? Okay, <laughs> I'm going to put my whole effort into it. Guys, it's not for Mother Teresa to be compassionate. It's for Brad Blakely, and you put your name there. We all think it's for super saints, for people who are just not like the rest of us. They're the ones who are compassionate. But just us, we just, you know, we don't have any time for that. That is not Christianity. How about number two? We ask God for compassion. I don't know about you, but I just feel like I'm a selfish guy sometimes. I mean, if it's not happening to my family or me directly, I don't even think about it. And I just, I, sometimes I realize, like, Brad, do you realize how, how little compassion you have? And that, at those moments, I say, God, I don't have a heart like yours. Would you break my heart? And would you give me the compassion that you have? I think that's important. Number three, we contextualize compassion in our world. You know, it's easy to think, if I was in the second century, I'd go, I'd be one of those guys on the, on the, uh, out in the streets and grabbing pagans in and nursing them to health. Or maybe you've imagined yourself like in the Civil War era or maybe before that, and you'd be like, hey, if I was living then, I would fight for, for an end to slavery. I would be right there with the best of them, with Frederick Douglass and all the rest of those guys. I'd be marching and everything like that. Or in the Civil Rights Movement, you might think, I'd be right next to Martin Luther King or whatever. You know, well, that, that was then. This is now. How are you going to show compassion today? We can't just keep fantasizing about what we would have done if we were in that day. What are we doing now? I think we need to think about it. One more thought with that is, I think sometimes we need to go through this like mental exercise. I did this last night even with Pastor Eddie because he's away with Christian at that deaf camp. Because I knew I was speaking on compassion, I just said, I want to just take a minute and think about it. what if I were Eddie and my son was deaf. And I did that for a while and thought through all the problems and challenges. And I thought, man, I haven't thought enough about Eddie and this challenge and loved him enough to pray for them that way. Sometimes we just gotta force ourselves. Guys, last night in this room, Lake Mead Christian Academy just buried its first currently enrolled student who passed away a little kindergartner two weeks ago drowned in a swimming pool. A lot of us were like, you know, I don't know the kid, and if I went to a funeral like that, it would just make me sad. 
What? That does not sound like Jesus. What if he said that? You know, Father, if I went down there, it would just make me sad. It's a pretty messed up place. No. He enters our pain. And he cries. And sometimes it's not comfortable. And sometimes we want to just stay at arm's length. And the longer we do that, the longer we don't put on compassion. We kind of stay away. And here's the last one. I'm talking to myself on these, okay? I think we practice it. We force ourselves. Like, in, like events yesterday. I'm going to that funeral. I'm going to let myself cry. I'm just going to make myself do it. But guys, we don't just do it individually. We do it together. And this is the part I think we're missing. When I, re- when I was reading, and guys, you don't even know how much I left out of the sermon, okay? You think this thing went long? You should have heard all the history I read about. I just, I just got into it. I just started reading all these stories of these churches and what these pastors were doing. You guys, I'm telling you what, there is a sin- sense, even though this is hundreds of years later, I can still hear it in their voices. This is something those churches did as a body, together. They were all out this, in this together, on mission together. I believe Christianity is, is suffering because we're not together. And sometimes we don't commit to churches because we don't want that accountability. We don't want to, you know, guys, that's the only way we're going to really develop these virtues because outside of this, these walls, it's not normal to live this way. In here, we're together. We're encouraging each other. We're saying, come on, let's put on these virtues. Come on, let's together become compassionate. Let's together heal our world. I think sometimes we've expected the United States government to heal our world. The government can't do what the church can do. It doesn't have the right motivation. It doesn't love with no strings attached. We have the truth, and that's what we're supposed to do. So I have a question, and I want to ask you guys seriously to think about this as a church. What ministry of mercy is God calling the Church of Lake Mead? What is it that God's calling us to do? If we were in Alexandria and Egypt in the second century, it would be obvious. We've got to go help this plague, you know, and it might cost us our lives, but let's go out there. You know, if we were in, you know, pre-Civil War America, we would know what to do. We need to help free these slaves. This is a terrible injustice, okay? But what is it today we're supposed to do? What is our church supposed to do? And I want to just give, put a little rock in your shoe, and I really would love feedback on this. I'd love for you guys to be on my Facebook and give me some ideas and let's talk about this and maybe next week we'll really discuss this. But here's one thought just to kind of give you an idea. The church at Lake Mead is a unique church. It's a unique church because we have a unique mission. There's a lot of amazing churches in this town. But our church has a unique mission. And our unique mission is to meet the spiritual needs of Lake Me Christian Academy. Now, we don't stay there. We're going to go beyond just Lake Me Christian Academy. But, like, that is our first priority. That's like our Jerusalem, is to meet the spiritual needs of this school. There's so many people who send their kids to our school who don't know Christ. And our first mission is to try to reach that. I believe one of the areas we can show compassion As a teacher at Lake Mead, I have to, my heart's breaking because some of my students can't come back in the fall. I'm thinking about this one little girl whose mom's a widow and she has sold everything and she has paid every dime she can and she just cannot continue to keep our kid in her school and she, that girl would be a junior next year. She would only have two more years. I'm thinking of another girl who's going to be a senior next year. I don't think she can come back. Her family's gone through a terrific experience. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm talking about people who want to be here, who if we just kind of work together, might be able to help them come back to our school to finish it out. Guys, I don't know if you know the whole vision, the mission of Lake Mead Christian Academy, but this is not some prep school for rich kids. <laughs> this is for common, ordinary people who want to become a disciple of Jesus. And missing these last couple years of high school is devastating. They, they don't get me as a teacher. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> but you know where I'm at? I, I, can, I can feel this. I, this breaks my heart. It really seriously does. And I think if we start to think, remember, this is not optional, this is mandatory. If we start to think that way, 
And maybe that's not the thing pulling at your heartstrings, but God will lay something on your heart, and you'll say, yeah, Brad, I, I love the scholarship idea, and we can kind of do that, but I have this other thing too. And guys, I just want to think like that as a church. I want to start thinking like that. How can we mobilize together to start living this out? I'll give you one more, and I'll be done, I promise. Over here is a tent and some chairs. And in the middle of the July, we're going to do a VBS, a vacation Bible school, at night so everyone can come for the community at Lake Mead and the rest of around our school and church here for these neighborhood kids and our kids. I was, to, we were planning this, Eddie and I and a few of the leaders, and I said, you know what I have a dream of, Eddie? I would love to see our church for a whole week, one week. We would just come every night, everyone in the church, like the whole group, and we would just love on kids, love on kids, love on kids. We'd have kid people doing puppets. We'd have p- kids, people doing skits. We'd laugh at each other, like, did you see Mr. Ellie doing the skit? That was funny. You know, I would love to see all that happen. We would just like pour it out and love and love and love. Maybe on the last night, we get all those kids to invite their parents. And we just do an evangelistic outreach to their parents and invite them to Jesus. Maybe some of those parents have never come to church before. And then we have a huge party. We high-five each other, slap each other on the back and say, you guys, good job. Just like this pastor did in the year 260 where he's like, good job, church. Like, that would be an awesome experience, I think. Man, I just want to, guys, let me just say this. If you come just to hear, and this is my big fear I would just do a great history lesson on some plagues and, you know, a long time ago, and you guys were like, oh, that was cool, that was neat, you know, and it's like, it's a good story, it's neat, and we just walk out like, okay, compassion. No, guys, let me tell you something. We're not here just to hear a story about what happened and read a Bible verse or two. Guys, if we don't do what we're, te- what we're, li- what we're hearing, why did we come to church today? If we don't put some of this stuff into real practice and people are really helped because of our Christian walk, why did we even come? Why did I spend all these hours preparing? And I want to challenge you to think hard about this question this week. And maybe you have, like I said, another idea. I'm open. Eddie's open. Let's do it. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to kind of wrap us up right here. And as you just pause for one moment and you think about compassion, is there anyone in your life that you have maybe overlooked that really has a need? I can think of a few people in my life. They have real needs. And I've kind of shut my heart out. I've kind of hardened my heart. If there's somebody that God is really putting on your heart, And maybe you don't even know it. Maybe you need to pray a prayer that says, God, is there somebody that you've put within my circle of influence that really I could help, I could show some compassion to? Would you just pray? I know it's a dangerous prayer, but would you pray that dangerous prayer that just says, God, help me to see with eyes to see? Help me to experience like the needs of people around me? And then would you also pray a prayer for our church as a body that we would just become just surrounded with a a vision for, for some sort of compassionate work. Would you guys just, would you, can I get you really honestly, can I get you to pray with me this week on this? As a church, guys, can you, can we do that together? Can we really pray together? Really, I mean it. Like really pray every day for, for where God wants us to show compassion. Would you join me in that prayer? Father, I do pray that we would not just be hearers, but doers. And God, that this this would not just be a nice little sermon, nice little story, but God, it would truly be a day that we decided that we will start to pray and start to live in a compassionate way. Lord, change us. Make us better people, more like Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.